Do you know the difference between a living trust and a living will? My name is Laura Hurd and I've been practicing estate planning and probate in San Antonio, Texas since 1987. I hear a lot of times people are confused about these terms and it's no wonder. For one thing, living will is not even really a legal term. It's, it's kind of a slang term. It's, it's not something that you can find in any of the law books. What people refer to as a living will is what an attorney would call a directive to physicians. And a directive to physicians has nothing to do with what happens with your property when you die, which is what a will does. And it's not really about living, it's about dying. It's about end of life decisions. So a living will or a directive to physicians is actually an advanced directive document where you tell the doctor directly what you want to happen if you're in a situation where you're in an irreversible or terminal situation and removing the life support would cause you to pass away. And so in that case, you can set up this document and at any time during your life, as long as you're still cognizant, you can revoke it, change your mind or change the document. But once you are no longer able to communicate, if you've already given this document to your doctors, then your doctors must follow it and do what you have set forth. You can get pretty specific about what you want, whether you want, say, a feeding tube or any kind of medical care like that's life-sustaining, like a, a me mechanical ventilation, resuscitation, defibrillator, or dialysis. All of those things would be considered something that a doctor could withhold if that is what you ask them to do. On the other hand, a living trust is about your property. It, it can control your property upon your death like a will, and it is something that can be in effect while you're still alive. The living trust, I like to call it something like a contract because it can say anything you want it to say. A living trust can be customized to you and it is, you can create it by yourself or with a spouse. You can set up who the beneficiaries are going to be, who's going to manage the trust and what property is going to go in the trust and how that property is going to be managed and when the property can come out of the trust and what conditions and what will happen to it when you pass away and who will be the beneficiaries and the subsequent trustee after you pass away. There's so many different factors that go into a trust that there's no way I can tell you what your trust says if somebody else drew it up and I don't have the document in front of me. I have to read the trust to see what it says because it could say just about anything. And there's no set rules for that trust other than some things that you wouldn't want to do for tax purposes. You know, you need to talk to your attorney and get advice on whether it's advisable to do some things or not do some things in the trust, whether that's to your best financial benefit. But really the trust can be written in a variety of different ways. And there's all kinds of different kinds of trusts, depending on your purpose for having the trust. Other people have likened a trust to a box. You put all your property into the box and now you control the box. As the trustee, you control whether that property stays in the box. If it's a revocable trust, you can take the property back out of the trust anytime you want to. So you've got a box that has your property in it. You can control that property. You can take it in the trust or out of the trust. And then when you pass away, you say, what's going to happen to the box? Who's going to take control of the box? And does the property then stay in the trust or does it come out? And where does it go when it comes out of the box? So a trust can be revocable or non-revocable. You can usually set them up as revocable trusts during your lifetime so that you can alter them, change your mind, put property in, take property out, and you manage it for your own benefit during your lifetime. 
But when you pass away, if you've done um, a husband and wife trust, a lot of times they're set up that they become non-revocable when the first spouse passes away so that the second spouse then can't take that property. If you have any property that you failed to put in the trust, then that property has to go through probate. So even though you've got a living trust, a lot of times you still have to go through probate with the property that didn't get put in the trust. The living trust has some flexibility about what you can put in and take out. And it also gives you the ability to continue managing it seamlessly after death without having to go through the probate court. But the bad thing about it is it's not filed of record anywhere. And so if you lose that trust document, then the people that come after you are not going to know what it was that you wanted done with your property. They, they're not going to have the terms of your trust unless you give it to them. You have to make sure that they know where to find the trust or have a copy of it. And I've seen many times families come to me and they have a piece of the trust or they know a trust existed, but they can't find it. So they have no clue what the trust actually said. And there's no way I can tell you what it said if you don't have the document. So the key differences are living will deals with your medical decisions in the end of life. Living trust deals with the management and distribution of your assets while you're alive and then also when you pass away. And it can be sometimes used as kind of a substitute for a will. Although every time you do a living trust, you should also do a will in case there's any property that you forgot to put in the trust. If you want to know more information about trusts, living trusts and living wills, I wrote called Divorce and Estate Planning in Texas, How to Plan Ahead for the Unexpected and Save Your Family's Future. It's available on Amazon. Until next time, I'm Laura Hurd.